Good afternoon, everyone. So this is a panel about uh, entrepreneurship. So I have four entrepreneurs with me, three ladies and one gentleman. And uh, we're going to make this uh, a little bit, uh, I would say, dynamic. So I will open the questions from the get-go. Okay, so if you have a question during or a comment, as long as it's not too long, uh, I will give you the floor in the middle. Okay, so we're going to break the rules of protocol here. So uh, first thing I would like to say is commercialization is, is in the core of this program since the beginning. Right, that was the vision. Uh, it's but to do so, it's in, it's important to have strong research, right? Because uh, otherwise, the results are not there, and it's not disruptive. And so, since the beginning, there is this will, this passion about this. And uh, in the beginning of the program, nothing existed, right? I mean, I remember when we were years ago and trying to build the ecosystem here, and uh, we're not the only ones, a lot of people contributing to it. Uh, now, it's more robust. It's not there yet, but it's much more robust. But, you know, we, we kind of experience the good, the bad, and, and the ugly, and uh, I think we're all here kind of to talk about it. So that's, uh, that's the goal here today. And so, uh, I, you know, there's so many words I could use to introduce all of them. So uh, what I would do now is to start by letting them introduce themselves. Uh, one by one, just telling me a little bit who you are and your journey, right? Why, within, within the context of this, uh, of this panel on commercialization. So starting with the lady next to me, Marta, please tell us about yourself. Perfect. So thank you, Marco, my cousin from the heart. Uh, and that will be made clear uh, once we start talking. So uh, my name is Marta, Marta Catarino. I've been a knowledge transfer professional in Portugal for uh, almost 25 years. I shouldn't say this. But yes, at least 20. She so I did not walk and she was already yes, doing it. I started as a tiny child. Exactly. But the, the important aspect is this. I was, uh, so I'm affiliated with the University of Minho, which has had a tech transfer office for 30 years. At the time where nobody knew what exactly a tech transfer office was up to. Uh, so we were doing what we could, European projects, trying to understand the beginnings of intellectual property. So I was involved in that uh, early stage, not 30 years ago, but almost. And then there was this uh, fantastic project we will be talking more about that helped us to scale up our activities. I would have to say, I, I said that in, a, in our emails tremendously, dramatically, but that's the case. So I've been a tech transfer professional at the Portuguese University for 25 years uh, and it has been a learning curve. I am still a technology transfer professional at the same university but now in the medical field and uh, I'm looking forward to share in which way because it was again tremendous. Um, the UT Austin uh, program helped us to professionalize our activities. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Marta. Marie. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria Oliveira. Um, I'm working in technology transfer and support of entrepreneurship uh, almost as long as Marta. I will not say how, the, how many years. So I started in the private sector in innovation consultancy. At the time, it was more European projects connecting enterprises with universities. Later, I moved to University of Porto where I'm still working at a different institution, now the Science and Technology Park, UPTEC, but uh, running first the Intellectual Property Office, then the Innovation Department called Uport Innovation, and later on the Science and Technology Park. So it would say that I started with the, the boring issues of intellectual property, moved to cooperation with the industry, which was much more, uh, I would say, attracting in terms of uh, work and in terms of results and then to entrepreneurship support, which is really what I love to do right now because you get to deal mostly with the people and the dreams they have to build a startup and not as much with the bureaucracy. And of course, yes, UTEN was um, fundamental in all this process because for a short while I also worked directly with UTEN trying to support the technology transfer office in Portugal in getting more mature and more experienced uh, in terms of what they were doing. 
Thank you, Marie. Andre, please. Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andre Santos. Uh, my background, I'm a biomedical engineer with a master's in medical electronics and an MBA with Porto Business School. Uh, I'm part of the founding team of Sword Health. So Sword Health is the first uh, Portuguese healthcare unicorn. So what we do, we deliver virtual care for musculoskeletal disorders and pain. Uh, in general, and um, I got to, uh, my responsibility at the company is to take care of everything that's international expansion. So I was the one back in the day, 2015, I think, uh, when we were super small, to, to connect with the team, Marco and the team, because we really want to understand um, getting the first connections with the U.S., trying to push ourselves into the U.S. and so on. So those were the first inroads in, in the U.S. that we had. Um, which, which was great, and we will share more uh, as we go for sure. So, our last year with you all. Thank you, Marco, for, for thank the invitation. You, Andrea. Well, thank, you, thank you, Marco, for the invitation. My name is Veronica. I'm a professor at Porto University, and the founder of DIRIMO, a spin off from University of Porto and Instituto de Telecomunicaciones. Um, I started uh, working at IBM when I was 18, uh, while I was doing software engineering at, at night in Argentina. So I'm originally from Argentina. I uh, finished uh, my uh, software engineering degree in the US, in California, and then took a sabbatical, <laughs> traveled around Europe, uh, stayed in Barcelona, where I did a master's degree on video game design and development, uh, always fascinated by the film and game industry. And then I PhD in computer graphics, um, who took me to work with uh, companies like EA and Universal Studios and so on. And then was very fortunate to join Porto University right after my PhD and create a research lab um, around 15 years ago. And the UT Austin and the EU were my first uh, projects that funded what we have today. We'll probably talk about it during the conversation. Really delighted, delighted to be here today. Thank you. So uh, what a panel, huh? So we have four entrepreneurs doing different things, two of them helping others, uh, and two of them actually with their hands uh, on the job and, and actually creating uh, companies. And so um, my, we have a, a fifth uh, person, Pedro from Fidzai, one of the co-founders of Fidzai. Unfortunately, he had a last minute uh, uh, urgency. He couldn't be here, but I'm sure, I mean, we'll have a great conversation here today. So don't forget. I want your participation as well, right? So don't, uh, don't and if there is no volunteers, I'll, uh, there's going to be voluntold. So I'm going to point out people for, for asking questions. Let's make this, uh, this uh, you know, interactive. Okay, let me start with you, Veronica. So I remember you, what, 12, 13 years ago, we just talked last week, uh, in Austin, brilliant young, you know, researcher with a great cool idea, right? I mean, I was with avatars and serious gaming and computer graphics. That was pretty pretty exciting. So you learned a lot from that first project, right? Uh, uh, and you, wanted, you were swimming with the big boys, uh, and you learned a lot from it. And I'm sure you have valuable lessons that carried you to the demo, to your Absolutely. career company. Would you, I would love you to share those, those lessons. I mean, so, so just tell us your story, that story from the beginning, from 13 years ago. How did you get here where you are? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I spent about probably a year and a half trying to find a, a problem worth solving, I would say. Uh, always very focused on, uh, on solving problems for the industry. So I do more applied research. There's people that do more theory, theory research. Um, and uh, I needed to create a team to actually continue the research I was doing at my PhD. And um, I was in Stanford University giving a talk uh, to a lot of neuroscientists and one approached me and said, um, we have an issue with kids with autism. Um, they have a hard time recognizing facial expressions and facial emotions. And um, it all started there and I thought we could actually create a novel method on how kids could learn by drawing and mimicking facial expressions on digital characters. So by that time, the UT Austin program was, um, was kicking off on the digital media sector. And I contacted a professor in Austin, Dr. Agarwal, a very senior researcher who's retired now. And together, we submitted the proposal uh, to innovate and come up with a, a new idea on, on how to, to solve um, the, inter the communication between kids with autism. Three years went by, and uh, the tablets came out to the market. 
So we, we actually started the research working with Microsoft. Microsoft was also one of our partners um, developing for the Surface. But then suddenly tablets came up. And in uh, two weeks, I put my whole research team. So we went from just me to a team of about 20 researchers uh, between master's students, uh, PhD students, and hundreds of publications that came out and uh, an actual software that came out that we put in the hands of people. We had more than, when we launched it, more than 100 users immediately from the community with um, kids, families with kids with autism that were using the application online. And uh, something magical happened with that project, which is the genesis of what we, why we created GDMO, which was we were with, working with more than seven associations of autism in Portugal. And in one of the sessions, uh, the kid that um, was working very close with us that had severe, severe autism, he couldn't even really draw on the application. Um, at the end of the session, the, the dad asked if we could let him borrow the tablet because there was no app store back then. And uh, we said yes. And then I asked him why he, if, what he was going to do with his son. And he actually said that he was going to actually use the application so he could actually communicate with his son. So that really unbalanced me completely because we built an application for one specific use case and then suddenly who was benefiting was someone completely uh, different who we didn't meant to. So first lesson learned um, was you know you never know where innovation is coming from and the actual need is coming for, from. So um, that really uh, changed the way I was doing research uh, forever. And it wasn't just anymore for gaming and films. It was actually trying to discover novel ways on how people will interact. Then second lesson, I guess, is um, what do you do with that research that you want to really put in the hands of people? And back then, we didn't, uh, I, I really tried really hard to get someone to do um, knowledge transfer to the industry, and probably Maria will, will talk more about it. And back then, I find it really difficult. So a question for everyone to think about is how can you extend the life of a project that is really looking to, to have a ton of potential, but as a researcher, you just can't really push it through. Um, and then the third one is, um, we're giving, uh, we're graduating PhD students and master's students with a lot of know-how, and there was no industry for them to go work. So it's, what do we do in that scenario, right? So I guess that's where I am in this bridge. I still teach at the university, and I, and I try to run the company as best as I can, mainly because I'm fascinated about bridging the gap between academia and <coughs> industry. So it always been like that. that. That's why I started working at IBM at the age of 18. So I guess uh, those are the key three lessons that I that I have. Right? Is um, yeah. It's very inspiring. So uh, keep their, those questions uh, bubbling in your heads. So let's stay at the University of Porto. Let's go to Maria now. So Maria, you uh, you leave a important park, right? It's an important uh, incubator. Uh, actually, uh, so you deal with, you work with entrepreneurs uh, every time. So I'm sure you see stories like this, like Veronica's uh, every day. So what would be your, I would say, your top advice for entrepreneurs that are here in the room? And I do know that some are here in the room for them to uh, start their company. They're full of dreams, right? What are the things that can be shockers for them that they could, should be aware of? Yes. So. Um... I would say that Veronica just had a, a touch point, which I, I found it's most common when we have those early stage startups, which is sometimes they are trying to develop something and they don't do the validation in the market, which means that they don't get the feedback they need to understand if there's really an opportunity there to sell uh, what they are developing. And this happens a lot. And I think it happens a lot, particularly when we have entrepreneurs coming from um, academia, so researchers, uh, because they get so um, in love with the technology. And most of the times, it's a great technology, which is patentable. It has advantages. But possibly, they are not addressing uh, correctly the, the segment of the market where to put it. So validation is one of the key uh, advices that we give to 
to our entrepreneurs and what we try to do within our programs, the School of Startups, really is customer development. So uh, from, uh, from the get-go is to uh, put them to talk with potential clients and to understand if really there's an opportunity or not. The second thing is, uh, and I think Veronique, you also touched that a long time ago. Being an entrepreneur, sometimes it's, um, it's a lonely journey. You will get uh, more no's than yes. Uh, you will work a lot. Most of the times you will, you will have like a second job. So being an entrepreneur is something you do on the side, either of teaching or being in a different company, whatever. And uh, sometimes it's uh, overwhelming. So you should, in as much as possible, have a team with you. Don't try to do it alone. So uh, the other thing is we try to match them or we try to make them understand that it's better to do this uh, with another person or with a team. Uh, because also uh, you get, uh, they get so, um, you know, caught in the moment, they try to do it everything alone. And sometimes they are focusing in something which is not their expertise at all. So those are those, the two points that I think that are crucial. Of course, there are other challenges and funding is, is one of them, but it's, um, I would say, it's later in the, in the process. Can I add just something? Of course, you can add it, 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 does, it has free nothing, speech. It has nothing to do with your, your question, but I was looking to, to the audience and as well in here. And I would have to say that one big challenge that we have in Portugal, not only in Portugal, but uh, well, I'm talking about what I know, it's um, you know, gender issues in terms of entrepreneurship. So whenever you have a panel with three women, the majority is women, this is not normal, and you know that. I don't know if it was on purpose, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, we, we told Pedro not to come just because of that, so we could say that. <laughs> Good yeah, 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 exactly. And just yesterday we had an event at Upitech, which is Upitech nonstop, and there were 25 pitches of startups. Of those 25, only two were girls or founders which is really an issue that, uh, that we, we should address. And Veronica, you're like standing out because not only you are a, a girl, an entrepreneur, but also in an area which is gaming, which is quite traditionally yeah. a, male, a male... Can I say something yeah. on that? I was at DICE in the US in January, February, which is the first event of the year that is very focused on gaming and business gaming. Um, I recorded a video, I can say this, we're not rec well, yeah, we're recording, anyways. Uh, <laughs> I recorded a video because I was at the lobby of the event and I just did a 360, the only girl there, it was me. That's crazy. It was insane. So you're breaking barriers, huh? Well, I don't, I don't know, but... To be honest, <laughs> we did not, I mean, this panel is here not with that intention, but I'm glad it's here. Right, so we did not say so we're not here because of that, but you're here because of your talent, but I, I'm glad you're here. So thank you, this is great, great angle. Okay, so let me go back to, uh, to Andre. So Andre, I remember, I mean, many years ago as well, and I don't want to count, but it was many years ago when we met in Austin, um, and uh, you were there with your, you know, a couple of your co-founders, then I met Virgilio afterwards, he came to South by Southwest, we had a panel together, it was great. And it was starting, and I know that in, in a field, right, you guys were starting in a field that people were like, yeah, it's, it, you know, he's limited growth, I mean, it's very traditional uh, uh, kind of practice, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool, but yeah, it's not cool that's worth it. I remember that, but I remember you guys with always with your smile, and I think it's, I mean, I told you this before, with a smile on your face and say, we're going to do this, I mean, whether you like it or not, we're going to do this, and actually, it was a great experience because you were with us for a while and we quickly realized that your entrance to the US was not, from, was not in Austin, so it was different, which is, which is great, it happens. FISI was the same thing, right? They started in Texas, then they, 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 their interest was in California. So these stories are great, but this anchor that we had, I remember, I mean, it's, it's invaluable. So tell us about that story because you led the expansion of the company yeah. to the US. Tell us about that story as well. No, 100%. So let me just tell you a little bit uh, about SWORD and why we created the company in the first place. So um, it's always about something that happens to you, as Veronica was mentioning, and so on. With us, it was not different from that. So Virgilio's brother, my partner, um, he, he, he suffered a car accident, uh, and he went for coma for, uh, for like 12 months. When he wakes up, he needs to have physical therapy, physiotherapy, sorry, physical therapies in the U.S., physiotherapies here. Uh, physiotherapy in, for, for on a daily basis, but because they live in Guarda, there were no access to phys physiotherapy on a daily basis. You can only have one session a week. So his parents, desperate, needed to take him.
came to Alcoy Town, which is the, the, the most avant-garde center for rehabilitation, you will know if you are from Portugal, potentially uh, in Lisbon. So they need to move to Lisbon for six months. When they came back, because that was the cap, they cannot stay there in Lisbon anymore, they went again to that emptiness about not having access to care, right? So that was the, the thought process of this family trauma that made us thought why people cannot have access to care, to physiotherapy, right? We do so many great things, but we cannot just have someone having physiotherapy sessions, and that access to care was the trauma for, for the family. So we start everything on a PhD uh, with Virgilio and so on, and um, back in the day, the PhD was, uh, was an MVP, not even an MVP, let's be honest, it was a prototype, but at the end of the PhD, what we realized was there was some interest about what we were developing, and our concept was we will develop a digital therapist. So we will basically have a technology that matched with a human PT actually can expand the reach and uh, any PT can take care of patients anywhere. So, but by using the technology, right? Having technology as that expansion to them, as an enabler to them. So our thought process was let's develop this digital uh, physical therapist so that can be paired with the licensed physical therapist and then they, everyone can have access to care. So basically this is why we, we then created the company back in, in 2015 and um, our thought process, in, in, we knew that we needed to do some, some, some shifts and we need to try uh, other, other countries because to be honest with you, Portugal was so small for what, where, where we can go and so on. So we need to go and push the boundaries. In the US, people were basically saying, you are a bunch of Portuguese, crazy Portuguese, that you are ahead of the curve. No one is going to have physiotherapy at home with a physio watching you remotely asynchronously. No one is going to do that. People like the hand touch. People like to go in clinic and so on. And so you are ahead of the curve. And to be honest with you, I think you will never get there because people will never shift to that moment. So remember this was 2015, right? So now the mindset is completely different because of COVID, everyone is used to all of this. And we take this as granted. But back in the day, they called us crazy, crazy Portuguese. And, um, and we, were, we were stubborn and resilient enough to say like, no, this is what makes sense because we know that access to care is not there. 30,000 physios are missing in the US to, for the supply and demand to match. 300,000 physios are missing in China for everyone to have access to physical therapy as they should. So um, we were completely against the, the, the wave um, pushing boundaries there. And, um, and, and the reality was when we went to Austin and so on was one of our first touches with the US. And, and, and as Mark was mentioning, it was not perfect for us in the sense of like, we realized that Austin was not like the, where we should land but actually gave us that perspective about the US market, about how the money flows, who pays for healthcare, how can we basically, before thinking about the product, we need to think about, okay, who is going to pay for this? Who's going to benefit from this actually return on investments about, we can uh, give physical therapy at home to people and we will avoid surgeries, we will avoid MRIs, we will avoid x-rays. So someone is going to benefit from all this cost savings. So we start mapping there and back in the day till that moment, we never thought about following the money and then the send who pays. We were still like, this is needed, we will push it, we will focus on technology and we were like three, three and a half years focused on technology development. But basically, this was the first time that we need to open our minds about follow the money, understand where you need, who will be the payers, who will benefit from this at the end of the day in the sense of the money flow. So if you delight the end user, which is everyone that needs to have access to physiotherapy, and you have a value proposition, which always need to have some return on investment and cost, cost savings for payers in healthcare, you will have the perfect, the perfect match. And we were pushing things against, against the wave till the moment where, um, so we started in Portugal with insurance companies in Portugal. We, moved, we, we expanded the business to Australia, but we always knew that the US was where we needed to be. So after four years when we were mature enough, we said, hey, we need to go now to the US, fully focused there and so on. So we flipped the company to the US. We, have, we still have like the R&D center in Portugal, 250 people here. And then we have the commercial team in the US. Mm -hmm. And we start pushing things there in the US, focusing there. And then we start having a massive success that started in, in 2020. Um, and then COVID came and then every, everyone went silent and then we were like, okay, what's going to happen now? And then the digital health movement started. So basically the, what, what I used to, to, to do as a comparison is, if, if, if you never saw, you should watch a TV show which is called 100 Foot Wave from HBO and McNamara when he found Nazareth and so on. It's really up to that, which is when the big wave came, 
we were doing this for um, five years. So we were super ready to be the first ones to navigate that massive wave and to break the Guinness record. The same way that McNamara was here three years prior, studying the sea, understanding how to, um, to deal with the, the Nazareth waves because it was kind of crazy. And when the wave came, it was there to make the Guinness record. So it, it's, it's about that, being ready, being prepared. And if people tell you you're crazy, potentially you are, but be stubborn and be committed to, your, to what you're solving for because the wave will come and then it's a massive pleasure to go back and say, we were crazy, but actually we are leading now because we were crazy. So it was a good crazy to, it was a good craziness to have. So. Absolutely. I'm kind of suspicious COVID came from your lab now. <laughs> and I'm not here for that. <laughs> anyway, moving on, moving on. So I saved uh, you for last, Marita, so they don't say, they don't think there is privilege here, right? So, but I do have a double question for you. First, Please. the first question is, you were, you were there in the very beginning of this uh, program, right? The Big you, Bang, yes. The Big Bang. I was so there. You, you were there, you were in Austin uh, getting uh, on the job training, getting, and, and actually participating in the design uh, of, of, of the activities, right? So what do you remember from that and how important that was uh, for you, uh, for your career? That's number one. But, but wait, I have a second one. And the okay. second one is you are now doing, I mean, you, you, you're a step back, right? So you are now close to the labs, transferring technology or helping transferring, transferring technology, licensing in a hardcore type of field, which is, uh, which is medicine, right? So medical devices, a lot of that. So long cycles, huge investment. Mm -hmm. So how do you differ? Because, I mean, he's, Andre is also in the healthcare business, yep. but it's hardware and software together. So it's not the same as a, as a medical device, right? So really, so how do you feel that their advice works in your field or not? Or do you have extra advice uh, that in your field is particularly important for entrepreneurs or for licensees of technology? Uh, okay, so um, thank you for, for putting me in the grill. But uh, <laughs> so a, a bit of the idea. So as I said, I've been in this business, uh, not as Maria. <laughs> Maria is way younger than I am to say, those of us who have been in the business of knowledge transfer, so intellectual property management, innovation management, entrepreneurship support, uh, those of us who started that more than 20 years ago, uh, it was really a very dark uh, field of something. We didn't know exactly what it was. So just to say that uh, UT, um, Austin uh, project was very interesting for us in many senses. To say, it was a manner of matching the Portuguese, let's say, winged mentality. Let's not just wait for something to happen, let's make something happen. But we were a bit of amateurs in all of this. And then when a UTN project, and also Maria was involved from the start, it helped us to really professionalize our approach to these aspects. And as I was mentioning before, it was dramatic. It was tremendous. We were able to discuss with like-minded people, with more experience, and um, the major gain that I think we all got from the U10 uh, uh, project was that we were able to speak the same language, okay? We were before doing a bit of this, a bit of that, winging it, as I'm saying, but at a certain point, due to our experience, uh, talking to our colleagues in the US, and I have to say, our colleagues in the US thought that we, in Portugal, we, are, we were kind in the dark ages. Uh, we got, uh, I was just uh, checking, and in uh, um, 2012, uh, we got uh, an internship uh, incoming internee from the US that told us, I thought I was going to uh, underdevelop the country that had no idea of what was going on in this field. So it was clear that we knew what we were doing, but what do we call it? 
So, first point, the opportunity to contact with our colleagues in the US. One, two major learnings from my side. The first one was we were way more organized because we had to be. I was in the Silicon Valley and they said, we just go to the coffee shop. And then we meet the entrepreneurs because they are there, we are all together, we talk and we build projects together. While we did not have that, let's say, energy or ecosystem, we had to be much more organized. So we have processes, documents, uh, all that bureaucratic thing that none of us wants. And uh, Veronica mentioned that uh, a little bit, like we don't want to go through that, none of us does, but it helped us to, let's see how to do this. Our uh, American counterparts didn't have to go through any of that, but they helped us to build a language that is the one that we still use. To say, for example, Maria, who was there in the beginning, like I was, uh, moving to another uh, entity within the same uh, uh, Uporto uh, ecosystem. Me, moving the same within the, the University of Minho to specifically the medical school. Other colleagues moving to UK, moving to like uh, Pedro Silva, uh, moving to IBMC in uh, Lisbon. So a lot of uh, um, different uh, positions, let's say, for the tech transfer professionals, but we were able to speak a single language and that was, I have to say, mostly due to U10 because uh, we were doing it again, wing it, now professionalizing. We call the same things the same, in the same manner. That was fantastic. We were not able to define, let's say, a model for the professionalization of the tech transfer professional career, which could have been a possibility, and we did discuss that. But those of us who, who are working in the field, we have the same language, and that helps um, a lot. So that was, uh, I need not speak about the specific projects that we supported because uh, both uh, André and Veronica are uh, uh, better, much better examples. But for us, tech transfer professionals, it was really an eye-opener, fantastic in so many ways. That's why I was saying it dramatic. Uh, that it was dramatic. it was a drastic change in the way we were doing this okay and uh, professor mendonza was there from the start so, so it was uh, i couldn't be any more f i could i couldn't flatter the pro the program anymore otherwise you would think that i'm being paid to say this but in fact it was fantastic then the other point so i learned a lot i had been in the business for five six years as a, a professional amateur when the U10 program started, then a very swift learning curve, how to move things forward, a lot of pressure, a lot of um, energy that we build upon. And now in the, so now I'm in the medical uh, area. That was the other question, uh, Marco, and uh, there is a lot to say about that, and also Maria has uh, something to say about that. Andre is directly involved in it, and even uh, Veronica. So the point is, going back to why U10 was relevant for us, is when you are in a high stakes, high investment, uh, high growth, area as the medical sector, learning and being able again to speak the same language with your colleagues from international, internationally is essential. The, my experience, which is rather recent, so I was in the overall, uh, I mean the 360 degree uh, tech transfer office of University of Minho, so managing anything from textiles to electronics, now strictly in, uh, medical, in the medical sector. So what happens there? One, great energy from the fact that we might be curing cancer soon, uh, to say, it's very 
uh, demanding but at the same time very rewarding to feel that uh, you have a purpose in working in that area. That is something that my whole team is very committed to. But then, exactly what uh, Marco was saying, we, have, uh, we need a lot of investment. We have very long time frames. It's uh, extremely demanding. What do we need to do now speaking, and I will cut it short, speaking to researchers. While we know these constraints, let's say very, uh, it demands a lot of funding and very long-term investment uh, and uh, strategies, the thing is, do not lose the sight of who will benefit from it. Let's not get lost in uh, the bureaucracy of the projects that we are applying for to get funding to continue researching. Let's not lose the sight on who is the patient whose life will be so much better once this biomarker, this drug delivery system, uh, etc., will potentially be in the market. But again, it does help us that we are able, and again, U10 was instrumental in that, that we are able to talk to international uh, found, uh, f uh, funders, investment uh, uh, partners in the same, uh, with the same language that we would be if we were not from Portugal, even though we are at the moment looking at, and it was mentioned, this morning, so Portugal might be one of the cribs of uh, uh, innovation in the near future, but we are able to discuss it as peers anywhere in uh, Europe and internationally, and that is something that only happened in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years, not in a case-by-case -case basis, but in a systematic manner that we can support the projects and not only the unicorns or the very high potential projects that have been coming out from Portugal. So this, this is a bit my thoughts, Marco. Fantastic. So we heard from them uh, all a lot of uh, interesting insights. First one, I would say, you know, cool does not sell. Right, just because it's cool doesn't mean it's gonna be a business, it's just cool. That's one thing, so focus on solving an important problem that a lot of people have and that they're willing to pay for it, right? There's someone willing to pay for it because at the end of the day, that's what matters in business, right? Uh, passion and work, we all talked about it. I mean, you're, you're, you're here today, but I'm sure there's a lot of uh, sleepless nights to get to where you are. Right? Because without that, you can have the coolest gadget in the world, but without putting up the effort, it will never get to the market because the competition is just too hard. Right? There's just a lot of good people trying to solve the same problem. Right? But try to solve it better than others. That's what, uh, what matters as well. Fall down, stand up. Right, Veronica? You know, uh, a lot of scars, I'm sure. Uh, you had two companies also, right, before or, or during or whatnot. So you know the hardships of, of entrepreneurship. We all hear the stories of Zuckerbergs of the world and Elon Musks, but for each of them, there is a million of others that fail, and it, it sucks, right? It sucks to fail, right? And so that, that's important, but stand up uh, and, and learn from it. Don't, don't, don't make the same mistakes. That's kind of the... the, the, the uh, the game here, and it's a roller coaster of emotions as well, right? And last, customer ecosystem. I think you touch upon that a lot. So it's not just about the patient in your case, it's understanding who pays for it, right? It's probably not the user that pays for it, it's probably the insurance, and, and each country is different, right? So that ecosystem to understand that is super important. So, okay, we have 25 minutes approximately with these uh, four amazing people, so it's your turn now. So what do you want to hear from them? It's a question over there. Carlos, right? See, I know everybody's names. Hello, Carlos Figueiredo from UPTEC. Thank you, Mark. Uh, two questions, one for the enterprise, one for you. <laughs> for me? That's, that's the oh one. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, for the enterprise, uh, on my right side and behind me, we have a delegation from Marseille. Uh, from uh, 
C'est un croisé en français. <laughs> and uh, they are visiting us, paying, paying back the visit that, we, that we, we did a couple of weeks ago with our startups over there. So for the entrepreneurs, what kind of uh, advice could you give about what should do or not do when they are trying to uh, come to our market as entrepreneurs uh, and foreigners? And for Mark, well, uh, it's the same, but uh, thinking about mistakes when uh, entrepreneurs are trying to go to the, to the American market uh, that you know very well, using also uh, U10, what they usually do that shouldn't be done. Thank you. Is it's the go-to market? It's, it's the Portuguese market, right, that you're talking about specifically? What are the kind of the nuances and advice, uh, advice that we have for people that want to come to the Portuguese market? Ah. Okay, I, 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 can, I can start. Um, that's a tough one, and I'm going to tell you why. And to be completely candid, and Mark knows me, I'm super candid and transparent, as we all are in the founding team. Um, the Portuguese market, it... it and we, I was discussing this uh, in, in a bit, yeah. Um, it depends on what businesses you are, to be honest. With you. For example, for us, we are in the end of care, right? So we needed to think about who pays the bill at the end of the day, because the patient tradition does not pay, or they pay a co-payment, which is super small, right? Um, so we need to please the patient, but we need to find who is paying for this and, and basically get the return on investment. So for us, the Portuguese market was super, um, thin and narrow because we only have two kind of payers that can support us. One is the National Health Service and the other one is the insurance companies. Within the National Health Service, the problem is like there's a lot going on on the National Health Service. Uh, when we started the journey, and we had a really incredible project in, in, in Portugal where the, uh, uh, an hospital had more or less 400 people on a waiting list for more than two years for physiotherapy and we were able to set up the tele-rehabilitation there for them and we, we cleaned the, 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 the waiting list in just nine months. So in just in nine months, there was no waiting list. We increased the capacity, it was wonderful. This was back in 2018. Till today, which is 2022, we haven't been able to work, to do anything else with the, with the, Portuguese, with the Portuguese National Health Service. And the reason for that is because there's certain um, bureaucracies in the middle, which is to pay that bill, it needs to be in a, in a in a code that pays telerehabilitation. So there's no code to pay telerehabilitation. And we are still waiting for that code to come up, right? So in the sense of for us, the NHS in Portugal, uh, the, NHS in UK, or, uh, okay. the NHS in UK is, is a little bit different, but that was one, one thing. So we were like almost a bottleneck in the NHS in Portugal. When you go to an insurance company, you have like 20 whatever in Portugal, but only like three or four are like the main players. And insurance companies move super slowly. So the question for us was, if we stay here, try to make a business from Portugal, we would be that at this moment, to be honest with you. So what we made was, let's use Portugal as the kickoff, the test bed, deploy the first things, and then let's see how we can scale up this in other markets where actually we can thrive the growth, and then we can come back and build up all of this again. So for us, it was like kicking off in Portugal, go to US, make that this hyper growth mode because of the US building private health system that, that we can do that there. And now we are back and building up stuff and so on. We are talking with the Ministry of Health. And now we have a little bit of different size that we can be heard. When we are like 10 people on a startup, no one, and even back in the day, no one was going to listen to us. Now that we are the first healthcare in Unicard, we have different levers to, to talk with, 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 with top management. So just to let you know that, not going to pay the romantic story about, hey, Portugal is great for us. Portugal wasn't great because of this. Portugal in healthcare has really few players paying for it, and it's really hard for you to scale up from that. Other businesses, I, I, it depends. The business could be really, really interesting in that sense. So uh, my advice would be, and this is advice for Portugal in, in general. First is, be so good you can't be ignored. This is a quote from Steve Martin, the, the actor. If, if your solution is so great, and Marco talked talk a little bit about this, that's how you escape from competition. That's how you make everyone wow, right? Be so good that you can be ignored. When you talk to someone, they will be wow. This is the, this is the real deal. This is the game changer, right? So that's the first thing. Have a massive, great solution that you can't be ignored. So that's the, my, always my first advice for all, every entrepreneur everywhere in the world. Be so good, you can't be ignored. 
Um, the second piece is, and I really feel that this is really important because I can tell you that in Portugal we failed, and let's share the failures, right? Because people don't share the failures. We failed in the go-to-market strategy. When we started the company, we thought we will sell this medical device that we develop to physical therapy clinics, and they will be delivering the service. Uh, what we found out after six months, and it was myself that was knocking doors on clinics and say, hey, we have this. Everyone is telling me, that's great, that's fantastic. I call them second time, no one answers. Third time, no one answers. Well, I, you get the, hey, this is great, this is great, first meeting, and then no one answering the phone again. And then I start, I was super naive because I needed to follow the money and understand. Uh, uh, traditionally, and in, in general, the physical therapy clinic wins if the people go there more often. So the more sessions, the more pay they will have, but more payment they will have. We were building up a solution that everything that their members were doing could be audited by the payers. So we were actually basically got almost like Uber trying to sell the platform to the taxi drivers, okay? And I can talk about taxi drivers because my family are taxi drivers, so I, 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 I can talk about that uh, uh, for sure. And, and basically, so we were actually doing the wrong go-to-market, the wrong business model because we are selling to those that didn't want this change to happen. And we were naive. Looking back, this is so simple to see. And we were naive. So I feel that the second advice is understand and follow the money. Who is paying for this? It's not just about who is the end user benefit for this. Who is paying for this? What cost savings are you bringing? Because you need to bring something for those who are paying for this. So and I feel Portugal and others are always the same. So I don't have an advice for Portugal specifically. I feel that Portugal is really open to innovation. I feel that if you want to go to a country where it's like you can do a test bed, you can do pilots and so on, Portugal is the best place. Uh, traditionally, people will open the door um, and, and you, you will be able to, to, to thrive and to try out innovation here. And then scaling up that business, it depends on what business that is, but be so good you can be ignored and always understand who is paying the bill because you need to have the value proposition for them. If you match, if you have match those, you will thrive, you will thrive um, in, in, in what you are doing. So I know that I, I'm not super narrow in Portugal because this is my experience also and I want to share like for me this is a bigger picture than Portugal uh, by being an entrepreneur. I can, I can complement you of without the time. So it's very similar experience with a complete difference. We're mm. tiny compared to, yeah. to you. But um, when, uh, when we were doing the, the project with UT Austin which was called Life is Game I had a very, very hard time breaking into, in that case, in the healthcare industry or, or therapies with autism because uh, people was very used to their traditional method and ours was definitely not validated. We were innovating, but I did find in the U.S. a much more openness into testing new ideas. So we really had to fight hard to get very innovative therapists to be able to be willing to, to test the new method. Uh, that we were creating. That was in 2010, 2011. And by the way, passion is everything. I wrote the UT Austin proposal at night because I had just had a baby. So either you're very well motivated or you don't do it. <laughs> okay, um, side comment. So fast forwarding then to 2016 when we created Didimo. We created Didimo because an investor approached us because of the technology we had. And from the get-go, I knew we wanted to be global uh, company. So with complete honesty, but Portugal was also just a test bed, a place where we could actually test the technology, but we never thought it was going to be our primary market um, because it, it was an industry that it did not exist here. So the first thing I did back then was before even deciding that we were going to be creating the, the Didymo, um, I uh, there were two game engines in the market back then, very strong, still are today, Unity and Unreal. And I knew it was going to be really hard to crack in into those to, to test if my assumption of creating digital characters automatically was something that was even needed, follow the opportunity and, and the money. So um, two weeks into January, Amazon had launched um, what they call Lambayard, which is a third game engine that they had just bought to Crytek, very big game company. And I knew that if I could, I could, I, I would knew if there was value in what I had, if I get someone big to get me a meeting and validate it for me. So I went through my network. It took me probably three, four contacts until I got the general manager of Lambayard at Amazon. And I got a meeting 
in San Francisco for the Game Developers Conference, and I flew just for that meeting, and they were really well prepared. They show everything they were doing on character uh, technology, and then I just walk in and I say, we're automating. So also try to be the best you can at what you're doing. And that meeting gave me, we want to integrate your technology into our engine. So I'm telling this story because it's all about really scouting for the opportunity and balancing. Maybe you don't want to be on the best engine. You just want to be on someone that actually needs you to make a difference and compete with someone else. Right? So I guess lesson learned are, you know, why are you actually want to build a company for just the Portuguese market? Do you want to build a company that is global? So in our case, it was we wanted to be global. Um, I wanted to build a team in Portugal for the engineering and the R&D team that I had. So leverage what you have right, as much as you can. Um, and then really be bold in trying just to make it happen. Um, with complete passion and, and everything that I said, uh, completely aligned with it. Great, thank you. So, you asked me a question, let me be very, you know, uh, this is anecdotal, right, from my experience. I'm sure there's research that covers this very well. But I've seen a lot of uh, entrepreneurs going to, to the U.S. from the outside, and there are big stars in their home country, and when they get there, nobody cares, and that's a big blow for them, okay? <laughs> There's a big one there, so uh, for their ego, and so that's uh, right. I mean, I'm sure you experienced that. Uh, a lot of awards in their home country, and they go there, nah, who cares, right? Because why? Because they don't focus on what they need to focus a lot of the times, right? They focus on technicalities of the product because they're in love with the product. They're in love with their technology, right? They don't realize they have such a technical mind. They don't realize that uh, it, nobody cares about that except for them and a few geeks that will, it will be important down the line, but what's more important is really what problem is it solving and at which level it's solving that problem and how big that problem is, how many people have it, right? So that's a big, big no-no if you go there and start talking about the techni technicalities of it and don't focus on what problems are you solving, right? That's a big, big problem and very often, very common. Also, uh, not going directly to the point, beating around the bush is something that is in our culture, right? Uh, it takes a lot of time to go to say something. We, we, we want to, I don't know if it's Shakespearean uh, kind of roots or what, what not, but I blame the French. But uh, I do think it's, it, it's important to be direct and to say something really fast because people don't have time. You're fighting for time, okay? Also, differentiation, big thing. Right? How do you differentiate from others? How do you show your product is superior? And don't come with the price, uh, right? Because a lot of times when people don't have anything else to say, they say, well, because we're cheaper. Because why do they say that? Because, I mean, Portugal, the labor is still not very expensive, so it's, it's, it's possible to be cheaper. That's not a good differentiation in technology, right? Because you, you're running a, against big gorillas that can drop the, their price, really, and take you out of business. And so why don't you focus on margin? If you have low costs, great for you, but have more margin, right? That's a big one. Um, uh, also, it always takes double the time and the effort and the money to do this, right? You have your own little budget. Okay, I'm going to go to the U.S. with this budget, and I'm going to get it in two years, and it will take you five years to get even, uh, you know, kind of sustainable, and it will get you, you know, double because things are expensive there, and so you've got to prepare for that. It's, it's a big, big, you know, clash on that as well. Uh, not having assets in America is a problem when you go pitching for funding. Right? A lot of people want VC money, uh, but then they don't have a company incorporated there. They don't have anything there, so VCs don't really do it because it's a huge risk. How, if something goes wrong, what are you going to get? There's no assets there. Right? So big, big no-no as well. So do like these guys do. A lot of the Portuguese that go there, what they do is they, they, they start a company there that is a subsidiary of this one or the other way around, like they flipped it. Yeah. And then they can say they're a U.S. company. We have other companies in Portugal that they have, you know, a, 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 an office in the U.K. And they say they're, they're from the U.K., right? So that's, that's, that's important to have assets in, in high P there, for example, to be able to get some, uh, you know, some, uh, some, uh, uh, some assets that are very important. And I think it's also part of our culture is being too modest. I'm not saying not being humble because it's important to keep humble during this, especially if you are successful. But being too modest gets in your way, and I think it's our culture as well, right? I mean, uh, uh, being aggressive is important because at the end of the day, you're competing with, with everyone is there 
trying to, uh, to, to take the business. Everyone is bold. Everyone is talking to everyone. So be that. I think it's important. Uh, and so, uh, but with, with this, I'll shut up and I'll still have a few minutes, I think, uh, like, you know, eight minutes or so. And if there are no questions, what I would do is kind of flip the, the room around and I would ask uh, uh, Brian Corgo. You're there. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Can someone give the mic to Brian? Uh, I'm sorry to put you on the, stop, uh, the spot, Brian, but Brian is, for me, I mean, I know Brian for, for a lot of years. He's, a, he's, a, he's, he's over there. Please bring him the mic. And, and oh, you have the mic. <laughs> Great. So he, he's, he was not expecting, this is not, this was not uh, agreed upon. But I've always been very inspired by Brian because he's a professor and he's an inventor, he's an entrepreneur, he, he's done it all in a very interesting area, especially, I mean, today even more, which is energy, batteries, all of that stuff. And uh, I, when I met Brian, you know, professors that I was used to did not think like Brian, right? I mean, they, think, they thought a little bit different. So, it, it, you know, he thinks very much on the solutions, on the problems, but he can be very deep in the technology and in the science, but also has the other side of his uh, personality and his experience. And Brian started a couple of companies before, so I thought, Brian, if you would, you know, wouldn't mind sharing those experiences with those companies that you sold, I would really appreciate it. I think everyone would, uh, would benefit uh, from, from that story. Oh, wow. Um, is, this, is this on? Uh, thank you, Marco. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for listening to the discussion. Um, yeah, well, so I, I first got involved in the UT Portugal program kind of on the innovation side, so maybe 12, 13 years ago with uh, David Gibson, yes. I think, and Heath Knocken paid me a visit to my office one day and started talking to me about UT Portugal program, and um, he, Heath especially, you know, I was interacting with him in some other things, and they knew about these two companies that I had started and my, my experiences. And um, what they wanted to do was uh, have a workshop in Portugal through the UT Portugal program on nanotechnology valorization. So that was my first experience in UT Portugal was coming over here uh, with one of, my, one of the investors in, my, in both my companies, co-founders, co this guy Paul Turk, who uh, worked for Arch Venture Partners. So we came over, um, had that workshop, and that, that, was, that was really exciting. Um, to talk to all the aspiring entrepreneurs, startup companies, and all of that in Portugal. And I, I was really impressed with um, all the energy uh, really about innovation that was happening in Portugal. And um, I mean, I think some of the things that you all have said here are, are very ap appropriate for um, you have to believe in what you're doing. Um, you have to go out and get market validation talk to customers, all the i stuff that Marco knows all about. Uh, and the other thing is about having networks, experience, people you can trust, people you can re rely on. So I think in terms of being a successful entrepreneur, wh whatever that means, different levels of success, it's really not just about you and your own ideas, but about your network, you know, who you're talking to. Um, in Austin, we've had a, a, a kind of small but very strong kind of community of investors and entrepreneurs, and that's, that's really fostered, I would say, all, all of kind of my success in terms of entrepreneurial activity. So I think the UT Portugal program, um, sort of setting up that, creating that network, that bridge between Austin, which is now an innovation center, um, to Portugal has been really important. And so I guess that would be the, the one thing I've, I've learned the most about in terms of starting companies and doing entrepreneurial activity is it's, it's not just about you. It's about your, your network you have, the people you work with, mentors that help guide you along the way, and the experience you, you build over, over the years. So. Thank you, Brian. That's great. Thank you very much. OK, final question. Yes. We have one here in the. In in the front, could you bring just a mic, please, real quick? Or you can shout. <laughs> because of a code. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, any of you have ever had uh, meaningful conversations with policymakers that would enable either to help more innovation to happen or for you to develop your own innovation? 
Yeah, that's that's. So he, here's the thing: when you are a startup, you are in a thin line about um, the survival mode, right? So be entertaining conversations for three years is is not an option. To be completely honest. And this is something that people need to shift mindsets. And one of the things that US has a little bit different from us here, and it's, it's cultural, right? So it's not right or wrong, it's just culture. Um, is about that, like move fast, fail fast, get up and, 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 and do, it, do it again, but you only fail if you fail to learn. That's the spirit, right? And, and basically, we cannot be like uh, engaging conversation like for over one year, two years, three years. And, and we, have, we have been in that path, to be honest with you. We even talked with like the, the National Telehealth um, um, Office, whatever it's called in, in, in English. And um, it, it was something like, they were always like, hey, now we will launch, launch an RFP understanding what's out there in the market. Then we will do whatever. And then what I realized is, they're now trying to do a solution by themselves. We have been doing this for, okay, so we started the PhD in 20, 2008, we are in 2022. So we have been doing this for 14 years. We are the world leaders in telerehabilitation. And what you do is you hear from us and you are trying to create something by yourself. Why? This makes no sense, right? And uh, we, we, we won't be able to be like delivering our time and our resources to something that we feel that that's, that's, that's going nowhere. So we are basically playing, playing us around so if you want to do something for real, if you want to execute something for real, let's do that. If you're just like playing around and so on and being with like in these talks with policymakers and so on for three years, that's not the startup thing. Startups cannot wait for three years. We always have, okay, now it's a little bit different because we, we raised tons of capital. Now it's a little bit a different stage, but at the beginning, uh, it's not at the beginning, since like two years ago, we always have a maximum of 12 to 18 months of, of, of burn rate. Right? So we cannot be like thinking like on, on this continuous, and, and I've put some effort on them, and we, we delivered that pilot in, in Leiria, it was super successful. Then I went to the, to the telehealth uh, institution in Portugal and so on, and then after like four years, what they do? They are developing a, a, a solution by themselves. <laughs> like, I don't want to swear here in public, but what the fuck? It's like, come on, sorry about the words, but this is like, that makes no sense, and it's kind of, when when we have this mentality, that's where it was, right? When you have like a company that's from Portugal, it's thriving in the US, and what you do is, I'm going to do a solution by myself with like five engineers when we have 200, really? Th that doesn't make sense. But so I think that's, that's something that Just pushing a bit on that, why do you think that is? Why, why, or what is the cultural thing behind that? Do you have a feeling for Yeah. That? So I, and this is like, this is a political subject, right? Uh, one that I, I don't love to touch because I, I'm not involved in politics at all and I don't want to be because I, I don't have patience. But um, the question is, when you're building up things without thinking about what's the best for, the, for your country, what are the best people to do that job, that's something wrong, right? And I can tell that we have a, a a venture capital arm, a public venture capital arm, that at the beginning, the people that were there were not like, they didn't have skin on the game. And, and you see that, the way that that was managed was about like, oh, I know you, you are from network, here's some money. And, uh, and these kind of things cannot happen, right? And it, it will always happen, right? Let's be honest. In the US, lobby is, is a thing and so on. It's always happening. But in a country so small as Portugal, if you are just do, not doing the right things and you are just basically keeping that network of politicians and not bringing like the experts to the table, you, you will die. You will die at some point, right? And that's why I feel it's like lacking. Why I feel it's lacking is like bring the experts, bring the startups. I know that, for example, now there's a minister of economy and so on have um, uh, are basically debates for, for some things and, um, and startups were not invited. Or there's one startup there that has like two years or three years. So you have like all these unicorns and so on and you didn't invite someone to the table to, to tell you what's wrong and what's been your journey and so on, it's wrong, right? So policymakers need to open their minds about, it's not just about I come here and I say, hey, unicorns, we are the most innovative company, country in the world and so on. Let's be honest, it's not about the, the police that we have made in the last years, it's about the entrepreneurs that are really good and the talent in Portugal is so good that they thrive and we are better than others in that set. So you have this, raw talent that you can just build up the country up and you, you lack on, on specific points and lack on helping specific startups in that sense. So I think things are getting better and like uh, uh, the job that's been doing on the transfer knowledge and so on, it's better. 
but I still feel it's lacking. We need to move fast. We need to be more eager to push, push, push for startups and entrepreneurs and, and, and put the right people on the right tables to, to discuss this. This is what I feel it's missing. Can I add, sorry, uh, uh, yeah. I You're gonna kill pissed, me, but of course. But it, it's just a comment because it happened right yesterday because we had a delegation from the UK and a former entrepreneur that's now helping startups going to the UK said, and this is coming from a former president uh, of the US, said the, the dreadiest words that an entrepreneur can hear is, we're from the government, we're here to help. <laughs> because it's, it, there's not a match there. And I totally agree with you uh, in the sense that, in fact, there's policy making and in as much as possible, universities and other entities are involved in trying to give advice, in trying to lobby in the good sense for good changes to happen. And then there are startups and entrepreneurs, and they should focus really in their, in their business, because otherwise they're going to get swallowed by the bureaucracy and by the red tape and everything in, in between. But I totally agree with you. I don't see why we have uh, um, initiatives fostering startups in Portugal that don't hear from the startups and from the founders. That's something that I still don't understand. They even don't hear from the incubators. It's kind of uh, mad. So, yeah. Just a little note yes. on that. I think it goes with what we are talking about. All of this, perfect. The thing is, if uh, it's not our the way that we do that in Portugal, I have to say, if we are waiting for having something systematically decided that whenever some type of council will meet, they will ask the startups and such. Uh, to join them, that's never going to happen. But from my experience, uh, case by case basis, if you have a very clear idea of something that you want to have answered or a project that you want to have moving forward, uh, both uh, Infarmed, Apifarma and such, they are very, very open to listen to you. I think this is uh, the major point. We would love that not to be on a case-by-case -case basis, that there will be a system in place. The system is not in place, as uh, we were discussing, but from my experience, when you want to contact them to say, we have these clinical trials uh, that do not follow exactly what has been um, decided, but for this, this and this reason, they are fully open to listen to us. So just to say, do not close the doors in the sense of let's expect this to be uh, a normal way of doing things. It is not, but they are extremely open to hear us and uh, open the doors to make it happen. That yeah. was just the and case. Just, just one last comment yeah. on that, like five oh. seconds, and this is the Pandora box. You opened it, I knew it. So the thing You're is like, troublemaker like um, you are. Yes. So it's like, <laughs> Policy makers is quite different from yeah. like the environment and those. So I'm not criticizing those. I'm like the policy makers, which is like the baseline for like the ten, what's going to happen in 10 years and so on, right? So it's kind of like, policy makers for me is really specific about that people bringing up stuff. <laughs> I just think we could be here all day, right? And my time management skills are definitely not the best, as you have already noticed. And so with this, uh, I would say it's a wrap. Big round of applause for them. It's a great uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.